Hey everybody, just thought I'd do a quick little video here because I've been focusing all week on my Instagram on the Drift Bobber and I wanted to do just a quick little video on these little lures that we hold near and dear to us here in the Pacific Northwest as a salmon and steelhead and trout lure. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of rigging and just very basic rigging just to show you how this all goes together. There's a lot of different ways to fish this and by no means am I an expert drift angler, uh, drift fisherman or a side drifter or a bobber dogger by any means. I, I don't think any of us that, that proficiently fish salmon and steelhead claim to be any kind of expert, but there's so many different ways that these can be rigged in it, and they're such a cool little lure. So I'm going to put some stuff together, show you a few different ways that these can be put together and rigged, and we're going to just look at how those look as far as what we're looking to achieve for a presentation. So make sure you stay tuned. We're going to have some cool stuff going on. So to go over a few of the just very basic intricacies of setting up a drift bobber, one of the things that we want to do is we want to think about the hook size comparatively to the drift bobber. There's a lot of different hook sizes. There's also different wire gauges of hook as well. Now a drift bobber has a lot of buoyancy, henceforth it's called a bobber. And it's really important to remember that you can use a fairly heavy gauge wire hook with a drift bobber and be successful. As opposed to the more modern soft plastic uh, steelhead bead where you would want to use a lighter wire hook or a finesse type hook uh, so that you get that correct presentation in the water. So what you're looking for in your hook selection is not only the wire size, but we're also looking for the hook gap to be appropriate. And when you're looking at that hook gap, we're looking for that hook gap. And if you take a quick look here, we're looking for that hook gap to extend past the drift bobber. And that's a really important thing because if we don't extend our hook gap past the drift bod bobber, uh, what we will run into is when a fish bites the drift bobber, they're not going to fully hook up. So the drift bobber is actually going to stop the mouth. Think of like the old alligator uh, in, the, in the cartoons when they're snapping along, chomp, 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 and somebody puts a two by four and they can't close their mouth. It's kind of the same thing. So we want to have that hook gap actually be a little bit larger than the drift bobber itself. That's key number one. Key number two is, and a lot of people don't think about this, and I've learned this through the years from old timers. And when I say old timers, these are, these are people that have fish this a lot. Drift bobbers are oftentimes used best in conjunction with bait and scent. And a lot of people don't think about the bait and scent factor with the drift bobber. A lot of people will go down to the tackle shop and the guy behind the counter says, yeah, yeah, you just go buy some corkies or spinning glows or okie drifters or uh, cheaters and tie a little bit of yarn on there and just throw it out. Fish will hit it. Well, while that can be true, we still want to have some kind of scent. So the addition of yarn not only helps out, but also the addition of bait really helps out when you can fish it. If you're in a no bait fishery, yarn is typically not considered to be a bait mimicker or soft plastic. It's just basically yarn. That's it. It's thread. <clears throat> and then you can use that solid drift bobber in that fishery. So a couple different things to keep in mind as we build out the ideal drift rig and we're going to go with a very simple basic drift rig that anybody can build so hook size is very important that's something to keep in mind the addition of yarn or bait to this rig makes a big difference so keep those two factors in mind and then sizing of drift bobbers that's all going to be dependent on your water conditions you're if you're running a very large drift bobber you're probably fishing in very limited visibility water but then on the same token, you could be in very clear water and you're really trying to get the fish's attention. I've heard a lot of information and all of it contradicts each other. So go out and just fish. That's the best thing I can say. That, that's how you're going to find out what size drift bobber is going to work. Don't necessarily go with, well, on a cloudy day, you want to use a number five oaky drifter or on a clear day, a single op birdie. We don't there's some differences there with that, or you're not going to want to go out and crack a double lot spinning glow on a drift rig through a run that might have two to three feet of water 
if you want to run a spinning low, you're going to probably want to run down in your smaller size categories like your 10s and 12s. Uh, and then with the addition of bait, we're just basically looking for the flutter movement. But you got to experiment around. It's going to be dependent on your fishery too. So with all that being said, let's take a look at a drift rig. So what we have here is your basic core essentials to tie up a drift rig. Now, you can get this type of fly foam at any given retailer. I purchased mine from Angry Rooster Fly Company. Rocky has a very good deal. It's a couple bucks a bag. And this foam will go forever and ever and ever, okay? But the reason why I like this type of yarn uh, or the McFly foam is, is that I can strand this out however I need to. So if I don't want as large of a yarn presentation, I can just strand this out just as easily. Now, there's other manufacturers. Atlas Mike's makes it. Um, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of others that I'm not even mentioning. I'm just going off of what I know. So the McFly foam, I really like their yarn. Uh, to build these drift rigs out. But you notice that we have uh, for this corky here, and this corky looks like we're down into our pretty small sizes, like we might be at a 14 here. Uh, what I've done is I've paired that up with a number four hook. There again, we're talking about that hook gap extending past the drift bobber. And the importance of that is that when we have that, we know when the fish grabs that the hook gap's going to be wide enough that it, the hook is going to penetrate the fish's mouth. It's a very important detail with this. There again, not a lot of people discuss that. We're going to take uh, either mono or fluorocarbon. I'm going to go with 12 pound test on this because this would be something that I feel comfortable in low clear conditions with winter steelhead and summer steelhead too. This size is a pretty good size. We're going to tie an egg loop knot to this. And if you're wondering what an egg loop knot is, there are a bunch of fantastic YouTube videos that can teach you how to tie this. I'm going to go ahead and tie this off camera, and then we're going to go ahead and construct our right. basic drift. So what I've done is I've constructed the egg loop knot. And the cool part of the egg loop is, is that what I can do now is if I wanted to add bait, I can push that line out like that. And I can put my eggs or sand shrimp on here, a piece of shrimp, loop that around, and then I can pull it until it, you don't want to ever pull through your bait like super tight. You just basically want it to pin it on there. But the egg loop is a highly versatile knot for these types of applications. So what I'm going to do though with that egg loop is I'm going to go ahead and take a small piece of this uh, McFly foam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my, my foam comparably sized. If I just took a whole wad like that and chopped it off, I mean, obviously we're getting a little bit out of scale. So Think about that appropriately as you're tying up your yarn. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and just take a tiny bit of yarn. We're gonna go ahead and clip that off there. And we'll just throw the bag of yarn on, on the ground. <laughs> okay, so this is one way that you can do this. There again, there's a million ways to skin this cat, but what we can do is we can take that yarn and we can actually put it through that egg loop and just do a quickie knot around that yarn. It's a very quick way to add yarn to our bait. You may want to give yourself a little bit more of a length of, of yarn to do this with. And what you want to do is basically still leave your egg loop to where you can add bait. But the cool part of using the yarn with this is, is that you can soak this yarn in whatever scent that you want, especially if you're in a river where they're like, no bait, but you can use scent. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know, it's what it is. So we tie that around there and we can pull that tight. You can see that it forms just kind of like a natural little puff there. And kind of the idea of yarn is twofold. Number one, it can hold scent. Uh, another is a buoyancy, but Really, it helps to tangle the fish's teeth when it comes up to grab. And uh, any kind of uh, uh, anadromous species like a salmon or steelhead to have these little razor sharp little needle teeth. And when they grab that, it gets tangled up. Much in the same concept that John Morris, a uh, good friend, uh, he uses that with uh, gar and rope flies. So it's still the same concept, just in a micro version. Now, this is the cool part of drift bottom. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and just feed our line through that corky. 
and that corky is going to come right down there to the hook eye and that's your basic drift fishing rig now one other thing that you can do with this and this is something the old timer taught me was to pin the corky in place keep some toothpicks with you and you can figure out where you want your corky position especially if you're going to be adding bait and much like a steelhead bead you can space it two to three finger lengths away however you want to do that but you can take that that toothpick and basically put it in there and it will pin that corky in place you could probably use t-stops too but a toothpick's pretty cheap you can also use the little rubber bristles off of a um, barbecue brush and they'll work just as well too but you can pin that in place now with that basic rig we can also remove this corky drift bobber and let's say we wanted to go for the Oki Drifter. Same rig, same basic concept. We just run our line through that Oki Drifter. And this one is probably the most deadly Oki Drifter in the world. Pink nail polish number three. Okay. Uh, that one right there works. Now, with some of these, you actually have to add a bearing bead underneath. And so when you're selecting those beads, you also want to keep in mind scaling and size and everything else. Such as the Birdie Drifter, which the Birdie Drifter, uh, you can still find them drifting around. Haha, <laughs> I made it funny. Birdie Drifter drifting. Uh, but what we're going to do with this is we're actually going to turn this into a spinning presentation. So we have to add a bearing bead. Otherwise, what happens with this is that birdie will not spin. So we're going to go ahead and add a bearing bead. And this is just a big example. I would probably go with a lot smaller bead, like maybe a two millimeter bead under this. You could even fish that bead by itself as a, as a um, drift lure. So any the sky's the limit. But we put that on there. And the idea of the birdie is that it has those wings and it just spins real slow and it's just putting off that spinning presentation. Now, other drift tackle that we can use, I'm gonna keep this bead on here just so that you can see it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end all answer to everything. But there's another drift bobber that's a very deadly and effective drift bobber. Uh, but the spinning and that glow is what same we call the spinning glow. Now, slides down the shaft and then it would actually make a spinning presentation I'm going to go ahead and see if I can't clear the shaft out on this one. Looks like it had a little bit of something in there that was holding this up. Spinning glows are, are multi-purpose. You can troll spinning glows. You can plunk spinning glows. You can uh, drift spinning glows. And this is about the largest size of drift spinning glow that you'd want. Obviously, change your bead size, downsize stuff. But they're, again, on the same basic concept. So a lot of different ways that we can drift fish and they're all real effective they all work in their own different way it's really up to the angler on how they want to utilize these but they're a super cool and super effective way to actually fish so as you can see there's a big variety of different drift bobbers and there's a lot of different ways to rig those drift bobbers but the main basis is is starting out with the appropriate sized hook tying the egg loop you can or don't have to add yarn. I prefer to add yarn just for what I was talking about in the video, catching the fish's teeth in the, uh, the, the yarn to help it get hooked up, basically. So it's just another way to catch that fish. And then also uh, adding scent or bait to that drift setup can make a big difference. So that's the basic ways that these are rigged. Now, they can be rigged under a float or in a traditional drift fishing rig, which would not include any kind of kind of vertical float or bobber dog and float which we'll talk about later on drift fishing is a very traditional method and and the thing about drift fishing is is that with that method you're presenting your lure and your bait down where the fish live unequivocally because you're you're reading bottom and another benefit of the drift fishing is is that you basically learn by braille, uh, feel what the river bottom structure is. You're gonna feel if you have like a consistent kind of gravel, if you're fighting over some very large boulders and, and structure like that, or if you have a shallow and then a deep drop off, it, it, you can really learn a lot by drift fishing, adjusting your weights. You also learn how to feel the bite, recognize the different types of bite patterns of the fish that you're drift fishing for. 
it's a great way to really learn a lot. It takes some time, it takes some skill, and it takes some lost equipment. A lot of what you saw in that box, I, I've found over the years of broken drift fishing tackle. It just happens. It's a part of the game with it. You're going to lose less gear and, and find more strikes with a, uh, a bobber, but with the drift fishing gear, you really get the opportunity to telegraph the river bottom, learn the river bottom, especially in areas where your perception is going to change. But it also is a great way to put that bait presentation in front of the fish. There's a lot of great resources out there in, in books and on the internet, but by far the, the number one quintessential book is Drift Fishing for Steelhead by Bill Herzog. That is the best book. And I cannot say enough about how that book has changed people's ability to actually go out and catch steelhead. So a lot of stuff with drift fishing. Hopefully we can go out and put some fish on the end of the line this year using some of those techniques. Drift fishing has been around for a long, long time. And it started out way back when a lot of sport angling started for steelhead in the 50s and 60s. People have been catching steelhead for a lot longer than that, but really the sport angling, the pursuit of steelhead really took off in the late 50s. A lot of the drift bobbers that you see are inventions and in children of the late 60s into the 70s and, and further on into the 80s. But a lot of the earliest drift bobbers that are out there they were developed in the late 50s through the 60s, and, and they were brought into prominence by the Pacific Northwest steelhead fishing community. They all have their different time frame. They all have their different manufacturers. The early drift bobbers, all solid cork. The later drift bobbers, polystyrene, styrofoam, basically. So there's a lot of different materials they were made out of. I've heard old timers say that the new corkies and birdie drifters and oaky drifters just don't work as well as the old ones that were made of core, cores versus the, the new ones that have the polystyrene. Honestly, I've, I've seen both of them catch plenty of fish. It's just being at the right place at the right time and, and putting that bait in front of the right fish. So nonetheless, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna really be trying hard to get more videos out each week. We're gonna mix up the history the lures, the tackle, everything else. So thank you so much for joining.